All right, we've got all the uh, time side bushings done, um, both front and back plate, except for the um, great wheel or the uh, main wheel. We will uh, make those bushings on the lathe, so that'll be um, something we do after we finish the bushing of uh, all the plates. But um, anyway, even without the uh, main wheel bushing, you can see it'll start with just a nudge and um, the pushover hammer kind of stops it eventually. But um, if I just set this going, that's pretty good. So that's good. Um, all those are all done. Um, nice and broached out, no more slop in the holes. Um, so now um, we will move on to the chime side, and I think I've figured out what I'm going to do with this uh, pivot hole, the second wheel on the chime side. I think what I'm going to do is just ream out um, the this bushing itself with just a really small bushing with, I think I have a uh, two millimeter, maybe two and a half, and then just uh, push it in there, and that'll save me from trying to have to knock this out and make a new one on the lathe. That's really what I should do, but um, I I'm not sure if I have tools to make that little notch in the that bushing there, and so uh, and lathe tools are expensive as well. So I'm just going to try and bush that. Um, if it doesn't work, of course, then I, I'll have no choice than to knock that out and make a new one, but uh, otherwise, that's just what we'll do. I started to do the rebushing work for the chime side, and uh, most of the wheels have pivots which are 1.3 millimeters in diameter, and so I go to grab these BB-13s. They have a bore of 1.25, which is perfect, just 0.05 millimeters away from being correct, and I go... I only have two left, and I need about six or seven of them. So before we can uh, finish the bushing work for that, we need to order some more bushings. I should have ordered some before. I mean, it's you. It's not hard to plan ahead, but now we just have to wait for another week for parts to come. Fortunately, the repair process won't be halted as we wait for those bushings. There's still a, a little bit of work that we need to do besides rebushing. And uh, first and foremost is the uh, lantern pinions trundles. Um, this is the uh, governor, and it has its uh, lantern pinion. And you can see just how worn out those are. Um, you can see all those flat spots. You can see some of those trundles are almost completely worn through. And so uh, I'll be going through and um, replacing those. And also for this wheel this governor, I will be replacing the trundles with a much thicker wire. And um, the reason being, there's just no need for them to be so thin in this movement because um, that's not it. This is the wheel that these uh, that the governor actually meshes with, the fourth wheel. Um, and so it meshes there, and you can see just how much uh, wiggle there is when the wheels are meshed. And there, there shouldn't be. There doesn't need to be that much. And um, the reason I know for a fact is because these two wheels, the third and fourth wheel, are actually the exact same wheel. They just have a different um, different arbor on them. And um, the lantern pinion trundles on this wheel, which this meshes with, are much thicker. And so um, I know that replacing those lantern uh, pinion trundles with a much thicker wire won't cause any issues because there aren't any issues here and these are the same teeth. So we'll be doing that, and I'll, I'll um, show that process. All right, to start with, first, um, I've gone through and measured all of the trundles in uh, the clock movement, and they are all um, the same. They're uh, 43 thousandths of an inch, except for the um, flywheel or the governor. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to replace them with wire that is 39 thousandths. And um, 
it's just kind of a, a middle ground in between the diameter that these are now, which is, oh, it's probably 20 thousandths or so. Some, oh, it's actually 30. So yeah, just a nice medium ground. Um, and so that'll just make um, the trundles last a lot longer, uh, certainly last a lot longer than they did. And um, oh, there it goes. I'm dropping things off the workbench. Okay. So first thing we need to do is pull these old trundles out. And what we're going to do to do that is we're going to open up those holes just a little bit. Um, the trundles are actually just held in by that um, stamped, it kind of has like a texture on it, that um, bends the brass over the hole just a little bit and it keeps these from falling out. Um, these are also quite short. They should be longer than that too, but anyway, that's why we're replacing them. So I'm just going to take my pin vise, get the brooch out of it, and I'm going to use a drill bit that is 39 thousandths of an inch. Come on. There we go. Load this into the pin vise. I think I need a pretty small, uh, maybe not quite that small. You can hear my birds. They're uh, pretty angry with me. I had them out earlier and they don't like it when I put them back away. <laughs> okay. Load this in. All right, now we're ready. So we'll just go into those holes Drill them out, and you can see it's coming out. Grab a uh, needle nose here, pull them out. And uh, like I said, these are pretty short, so I'm going to be um, using some that are a little longer than this, but you can see the, uh, the wear on that trundle. Good gravy. Just look at that. It is so thin through the middle there. That is insane. I bet I could probably just snap it in half. Oh, maybe not. Either way, that is just way too thin. So that's why it's important to replace trundles because those can actually snap during the operation. Um, if that were to wear any more, then that would snap the next time it was um, the clock went to strike, and then, of course, that would stop the movement. It's uh, basically losing a tooth, and so that would definitely stop the movement. And so that's why we're replacing them in the first place. So we'll get all those pulled out. Get all the holes drilled. And uh, this movement is actually pretty nice to us. Um, those trundles are just uh, set in there. And then, like I said, just have that uh, stamping over the top of them. So they, they come out really nicely. Some others have a really big notch taken out of the, um, of the, uh, oh. There's a specific name for the two shoulders of this, the uh, the shroud. Some of these have a really big notch taken out of the shroud that holds the um, holds the trundles in. But this one's nice. It just needs just a little bit of drilling to come out, and then these will just fall out. So that's good. They're not uh, friction fit or anything like that. And that one actually just fell out. Didn't even need to pull that one out. Seems like my pliers are magnetized. That's kind of annoying. Okay, there we are. We've got all the uh, trundles pulled out of the shrouds there. 
looks kind of weird um, without them. But now what we'll do is oops, we will finish drilling out those holes to the, the size of the wire that we're going to be using. So I'm just going to use this to drill through all those holes. Okay, and I'll do that for all of them. Okay, I've got one trundle. Um, I just randomly cut it to see how uh, long they needed to be, and I actually got pretty close. But uh, that is too long, though. Um, you can see it sticks up past the shroud. So we'll pull that out, and I'll um, use that as somewhat of a template, but I'll make sure to uh, cut them just a little bit shorter than that. And um, I'm just cutting those from this wire, like I said, and I'm using these um, wire, hard wire cutters. These are actually really nice because instead of... Um, pinching the wire and cutting it like that, it actually shears it. So as the wire goes in, you can see there's the uh, the two uh, jaws. They don't really pinch it, they kind of push it and uh, separate it from the other part of the wire. So those, that actually is a really nice, um, gives it a nice flat um, cut. And so it's not all jagged and whatnot. So. Um, I'll cut out the rest of those, and um, I'll show you how to put them in. Okay, got all those cut. Um, I actually got lucky. I never lost a trundle, but um, once or twice, the uh, the long side of the wire I was cutting just flew off. And um, even though it was pretty big, I somehow lost it. Had to get down on my hands and knees and look for it. But um, anyway, what I found to be effective when using these cutters is just holding out a hand and uh, careful not to pinch yourself or anything, but just catching the um, the new trundles as they fly off. But uh, I didn't think about the other end of the wire, of course, so it managed to escape me. Anyway, now what we'll do is we will take these trundles, our new trundles, and just drop them in. And I think uh, my drill bit must be just a smaller diameter than these wires because it is a pretty good uh, pretty tight friction fit with these new wires but uh, we'll just be real careful because we don't want to scratch up the pivot and we'll just place these and use these are not wanting to cooperate There it goes. Use the uh, pliers to push them in, just like that. Second one. Get it seated. These magnetized pliers. Um, I have a cheap little uh, demagnetizer, but I've noticed that uh, it won't completely take the magnetization out. It'll still leave just a tiny bit, so it's enough to uh, pick up little little uh, tiny screws. So it probably wouldn't even help here. lined up properly. There it goes. And uh, my trundles aren't very consistent, but that's okay. As long as they don't extend too far past the uh, shroud and uh, extend all the way down to the bottom. That's just fine. Sorry if I don't get 
some of this on camera. I've got it uh, right here in between my hands, so it's kind of awkward to uh, try and work and film at the same time. That one's not wanting to go in. There it goes. All the way. Two more. Last one. And there we are. Brand new trundles. Those should last quite a while. And uh, normally what I would do is uh, take some blue Loctite and uh, just put it on a little bit on those trundles. But with them being so uh, tight in there as it is, I think they'll be just fine. And um, some people I know of, they use uh, red Loctite. Red is more permanent than blue. But um, in my mind, the trundles will have to come out eventually um, if the clock keeps running. Um, in an optimistic, perfect world, it'll run for another hundred or so years, then they'll have to be replaced again. So I like to use blue, um, but even better that uh, those are just friction fit in there because we don't even have to worry about that. So now we'll uh, go ahead and do the same thing on um, all the other wheels that need it. And um, we will be using the um, thicker wire. I actually have that same gauge of wire as the rest of the... Um, other trundles are. Um, but before we do that, I suppose I should make sure that I was right in saying that we can use the thicker wire. Here are the wheels back in the plates, and as you can see, they are meshing just fine. So all my worry was for nothing. And uh, we'll go ahead and do that with all the wheels that uh, needed those trundles replaced. You can see on this fourth wheel, you can see some of those flat spots, those shiny spots. So we'll go ahead and do it to the rest of the wheels now. Here we've run into a little bit of a problem. Um, you can see the uh, the stamping on this particular uh, lantern pinion is much, much closer to those trundles, and it actually has stamped over those trundles, and it uh, has kind of meshed the brass with the steel. So I could try and file that or whatnot, but um, Instead, what I'm going to do is I'm not even going to try and pull those out the top. What I'm going to do instead is I'm just going to cut these and pull them out um, from the bottom for the top ones and then from the, on, uh, from the top on the bottom ones. So I'll just take my uh, other hard wire cutters. I'll actually want to let's see if these will be able to get in there. This can be kind of tr tricky, um, especially the first one, just because the... Uh, the trundles are so close together, it'll, it's kind of hard to get your cutters in between. Maybe. Okay. I'm going to use different, uh, different size. These are a lot uh, easier, these straight ones. Except for these are cheap, so they, <laughs> they do not like to cut. I really don't like to cut, my goodness. 
Oops. Oh. Did we even get it? <laughs> I don't think so. Wow, yeah, these are cheap. But uh, anyway, that's what we'll do. We'll, um, once we get the first one cut and out of there, it'll be easier to cut the other ones. But uh, because we can't pull it from the top, we'll just cut them and pull them out from the middle. All right, now that I've got a few out of there, it's much easier to cut these so I can actually show you on camera. So we'll just get our uh, wire cutters and cut that. That one didn't quite cut it all the way through. Um, so anyway, a lesson you can take from today is uh, don't buy cheap tools. <laughs> um, those green pliers came from Harbor Freight, and you can see how well they did. So yeah, just if you're doing something with, especially with hardened steel, if you're doing anything with hardened steel, just get good pliers and uh, good tools like uh like these ones obviously these ones are just so much better than those cheap ones and they work a lot better we've got one more let's see if we can actually coax this one out the top just out of curiosity oh we did. And there we are. All right. Now we will take a um, drill bit that is the same diameter as this wire, and this wire is uh, 43 hundredths, or excuse me, 43 thousandths of an inch. And so we'll just go in, clean up the holes a bit. Get rid of that uh, stamping. These ones are actually uh, pretty clean because uh, the steel from the existing pinions, or excuse me, not pinions, the existing trundles was already just so close to the, the edge of the hole, so it didn't really close up the hole as much as it did just mesh the uh, steel with the brass. So now with those all cleaned out, we'll take our hard wire, excuse me, and we'll just, uh, I'm just going to take a, uh, take a little piece of it. both flew off. And uh, just to see how long we need to make them. Yeah, it seems like those drill bits are just a little bit uh, smaller than the actual wire was. They don't uh, drop in there like the uh, originals did. There it goes. Oh, you know, that makes sense. I must have been using the, uh, the one side of the wire that wasn't cut. Yeah, so here's uh, an example of what a piece of cut wire will look like if you don't use those cutters. So it kind of uh, bulges one side of the wire while those smooth ones... Oh, well, <laughs> maybe not. I stand corrected. Seems like both sides have a pretty... Uh, gnarled edge but let's just see oh yeah yeah so those those cutters are definitely worth the investment they're not very expensive maybe like 20 bucks or so um anyway it just gives it a nicer nicer edge so now with those in place it needs to be about that thickness so what i'm going to do I'm just going to take a, uh, this is just a smoothing brooch, but I'll try and scratch up that steel. Does it do anything? Faintly. 
All right. And we'll use that as a template. I'll go ahead and cut it at that spot. Okay. Let's see how I did. Seems to be kind of short, just from the naked eye. But looks to be about perfect. Nice. Make sure that that's seated. Doesn't seem... There it goes. Okay, yeah. It was just a little bit short, but because the um, top shroud is uh, pretty thick, that'll be fine. As long as it's more than about halfway into the shrouds, then they'll be all right. All right, so we will go ahead and use that as a template to cut our rest of our wire out. All right, with those new trundles in place, um, we will be Loctiting these down. Um, they're not nearly as tight as those other ones were. So we'll just take our Loctite and very carefully put down a blob and uh, we'll use this paper towel to clean up our excess and also to make sure that it spreads to all of those other trundles and it should have uh, been pulled down into them and there we are, new trundles. All right, got those bushings ordered. Now, in the meantime, what we can do is we can actually make the uh, main wheel bushings. So I've already knocked one out. I'll just show you what that looks like. We'll use our uh, anvil and a punch. And uh, these ones are kind of interesting. Um, these normally aren't, um, they don't normally have an oil sink cut into them on the back side, on the rear plate, but uh, that won't affect anything. So we'll just put our steak or our uh, punch in. There we are. And because that was chamfered on the inside, it kind of sticks to my. There it comes. All right. So now what we'll do is we will take measurements of this and uh, make a new one on the lathe. Here we are back at the lathe. Um, I figured that I would uh, time lapse this to show the whole process and not take too long. So here we are turning down the brass to the diameter that we need. And there's actually two diameters that we need. The part of the bushing that actually goes into the plate and then the uh, just the one that sticks out. So we'll go ahead and cut both of those right now. And once we are done with that, we will use a um, center drill to drill a center hole um, right in the middle of our bushing, and then use progressively larger uh, drill bits to drill out the hole that we need. And uh, these bushings will need to be broached out anyway. All right, we've got uh, one of those bushings made. And uh, before we make the other ones, I just want to make sure that my measurements were correct. And uh, I did take just a little bit off the um, the top of it, just so that the uh, pivot of the wheels will extend past this, so then we don't have any uh, tunneling going on. But anyway, before um, I make any more with those measurements, I just wanted to make sure that they will actually work, that they'll extend through the plates. Yeah, that looks pretty darn good. So, um, now what we need to do to this to make sure that it stays in is we will <coughs> Let me just bring the camera down a bit. We will um, hammer the heck out of it and to bring those edges, um, the edges of this bushing down into the plate so that it uh, kind of peens it in place. That's the word I was looking for. So we'll just take our hammer and hammer away at it. 
feels pretty good. I may uh, go over it a few more times though. Seems like it got a little uh, crooked. Must have been holding it a little at an odd angle against the anvil, but uh, we'll just keep hammering on that. Okay. That seems pretty good. Okay. Now I'll uh, go ahead with making the rest of them. Alrighty, now that we've got all those bushings turned and installed, the next step is to approach them out. So I'll start with the uh, chime side. As you can see, I used a drill bit that was uh, smaller than the actual diameter of the pivot. Now I'll take my cutting brooch and these ones are huge. <laughs> um, normally these are quite small, but this obviously is a much bigger uh, operation. So we will start broaching that out. Here's the moment of truth with the wheel in place. And uh, it does spin. And it spins quite nicely. Um, I haven't smoothed this uh, bushing yet, but you can see um, there's no more wiggle in those has good end shake and so uh those are good one thing that needs done that not very many people even think about is uh the crutch assembly um so this is the escapement this is the uh the verge and the crutch and um this little brass it looks like a saddle um this u strap um this gets worn out because um the arbor that it sits on is steel and it is brass and so there's going to be some wear there and um, as you can see instead of just moving back and forth like it should it also has a lot of wobble um, on that back hole it's pretty worn out and so the fix for this is just the same as with any other bushing so you need to ream out the hole after finding true center ream it out and uh, place a new bushing in and then ream out that new hole to the right size. Um, another thing that we will be doing with this anchor is polishing the bearing surfaces. So as the teeth of the escapement wheel slide across this, um, it can sometimes wear grooves into it. And on this clock, it's actually surprisingly um, not as bad as some others that I've seen, but there you can still see tiny little flat spot there um, it's it's hardly anything, but uh, we will polish it anyway and also just try and clean up some of the rust in there. And um, rust removal will be uh, one thing that we do towards the end just to keep things all nice and polished and shiny. But uh, anyway, we'll, we'll also do that work on this crutch. Here is the repaired anchor assembly. I've rebushed both sides of that U-strap and... Uh, polished up the bearing surfaces on the actual anchor. And so now if we put this on here, you can see it turns quite freely. It also doesn't have the wobble in it like it used to. So that's pretty good. Okay, one thing we're going to work on is the hands and uh, the hand nut. Um, during the disassembly of the movement, um, my pliers were slipping all over the place, and even with that little bit of cloth, um, the hand, knot, hand nut got a little scratched up. So I've got it all polished up again, and um, that's not what it's supposed to look like. It's supposed to be just like the hands, so a nice dark color. So what I'm going to do, I have some brass darkening solution. I'll grab that. This is what it is. I think it's uh, some sort of acid that uh, oh, darkens the brass. So we will suspend it just using a little bit of wire. 
just like that. Now we'll set that off to the side. We're also going to work on the hands right now. Um, you may not be able to see, they're just a little bit rusty. Um, the bluing on this movement, this clock, seems to have failed. Uh, there's just a lot of rust on the bluing. So I'm just going to take some steel wool and try and uh, clean up the hands a bit. I've got these uh, hands cleaned up now. Um, I ended up using my emery buffs in addition to the steel wool to get all of the uh, old bluing and rust off. So now what we'll do, grab a few more Q-tips. What we'll do is we'll take this uh, perm perma blue and uh, Apply it to these hands. You can see how fast that uh, reaction happens, how they darken right up. Pretty cool. And uh, I've heard that the super blue is better than the perma blue, but uh, I just have perma blue. So we'll just work with that. And I'll probably end up putting a few coats on these hands just to give them a nice dark look. They were originally blued so that they were black. So that's what we'll try to replicate. Here's the hand nut out of that solution and rinsed off. So now uh, we'll just set this aside to let it dry. My birds are just losing their minds over there. But um, anyway, we will put another coat on these hands here and uh, get them nice and dark. I may end up having to buy that uh, the super blue if I can't get the perma blue to get as dark as I want it. But for now, we will just try with what we have. Here are the hands after about three coats of chemical bluing and an overnight soak in oil. Um, they actually look worse on camera than they do in person. In person, they're stark black, but they look a little gray on camera. But um, you've got to uh, soak... Um, the steel in oil if you're wanting to get a good finish on them and so that's what I did and I actually know of some people who use oil anyway even if they're not bluing the hands just to add a uh, <clears throat> protective layer from your fingers because the hands get touched quite a bit when you're setting the time and maybe even winding it you might just brush up against them so the oil um, will protect them from the salts and the other oils from your fingers here we've got that bushing installed on the strike side second wheel. Um, you can actually hardly even see that it's there. I used a bushing that is two millimeters in diameter, one of the smallest that I had, and it's actually um, two millimeters tall as well, and so that'll extend through the um, this bushing here. The pivot won't actually extend past the plate, but the um, that hole isn't actually a bearing surface that we see here. Um, deeper down in there, there's the bearing surface. It's kind of hard to see on camera, but anyway. Um, when I installed that bushing in there um, and got it all broached out, it uh, didn't have any end shake. The wheel was being held in by friction by the plates. And so what I usually do to rectify that is I take my um, chamfering bit, this tool here, and um, I just chamfer out the uh, inside of the bushing just a little bit, and uh, that usually rectifies any uh, end shake problems. I actually did it on both ends of the plate on both of those bushings. Um, just gives it a little bit of wiggle room for the shoulder of the pivot to move around in, and it does um, take care of the end shake problem nicely. So that's uh, one bushing that I don't have to worry about anymore. Okay, we finally got our bushings in, and so I've gone ahead and installed them and uh, done everything with them. Now we are moving on to some of the final stages in the restoration. Um, that is the final cleaning. And I'm going to put on a pair of gloves. Um, 
you don't need these gloves uh, really tarnishing on the brass of the clock. It really doesn't matter. Nobody's ever going to see the movement except for the uh, next person who works on it. But uh, I like to uh, make the plates look nice and shiny again and also the wheels. So um, I'm going to be wearing gloves not because of the uh, chemical that I use as abrasive or anything like that. It's just the fact that uh, I have really, really oily fingers and um, the brass tarnishes quite uh, quickly with that. And so what we're going to do to uh, clean these up is I'm just going to take this uh, cleaner. This is a uh, gel gloss. Um, it's formulated for acrylic, like uh, bathtubs or sinks and whatnot, but it does a really nice job with brass. So I'm just going to take it and just clean up the plates a bit. Now that we've got all the parts polished up, uh, what we need to do is peg out the bushings that we installed. Um, they get pretty dirty from the cleaning process with that stuff. You can see just how dirty they are inside. So once we get these all pegged out, um, one of the other things we need to do is uh, grease and reinstall the mainsprings and then assemble the movement. To lubricate the mainsprings, this is what I like to do. I take my uh, Keystone mainspring lubrication. It's a pretty heavy grease, but uh, I'll take it, take the mainspring, and just pour some onto a brush and brush it onto the mainspring. Um, there's a lot of other things that I've seen people do. Um, sometimes what they'll do is they'll just stick the entire uh, assembly with the main wheel and the spring and put it all into the mainspring winder and stretch it out and oil it that way with a, a paper towel that's wet with the oil, the grease. Um, I don't like to do that. I don't like to put that much stress on the mainspring, even though it's going in the opposite way that it does when you wind it. I just don't like to stretch out my mainsprings. So this is what I do, just a fairly simple process. Um, doesn't take much, just a paintbrush. And... Now with the mainsprings recaptured comes the great chore of uh, reassembly. So I'll put all the parts back in and uh, align all the pivots and screw it down. Okay, we've got the movement all back together. Now uh, what we need to do now, let's reinstall the crutch of course. Verge, anchor, escapement, whatever you want to call it. There it goes. Alright, now that's everything. And uh, took a while to do. <laughs> um, it's always a pain because you've got all of these pivots to align and um, some things like the hammer and some of these lever are on a spring and so of course they want to shift away from their pivot. So it's it's a, quite a pain in the butt to get it to all line up. But the best thing to do is just get a little piece of PVC pipe, lay the clock down flat so you have a good working surface, and then um, use a pivot locator. Um, dental picks also work. And um, anyway, these aren't too expensive. You can get them from time savers. But anyway, um, now with everything all together, what we'll do is we'll make sure that uh, everything is working. So we'll uh, wind up mainsprings and get these uh, get the clamps off That's the time side and actually before I take off the one for the strike side or excuse me the time side I'm just going to make sure that the warning works And coming up on the hour. Maybe not. Hold on. Half hour. And good. Perfect. It's another nightmare about uh, 
getting these all aligned is uh, you have to make sure that the chime side is timed properly because this uh, there's a little warning pin here that uh, gets stopped by the lever when it's lifted up anyway. It just ensures that the, the clock actually strikes at the hour instead of at the uh, 10 or five minute mark. And um, that all has to be timed properly. So while you're trying to put all the pivots in, you gotta make sure that those wheels stay in place. And it's just a complete nightmare. So that's usually the process that takes um, a really long time trying to uh, get that all worked out but anyway that's good now so we will uh, wind up this time side get the clamp off there we are now this movement is ready to go back into the case oh excuse me we need to oil it first of course so um, I'll take my Clock oil and oiler, and uh, I'll zoom in, get a different angle to show oiling. All right, with oiling, um, one of the most important things you need to make sure is you don't oil too much. Um, clocks have oil cups at the pivots, and some people think that those cups need to be completely filled. They do not, and they should not, because uh, capillary action will pull them out of that oil cup and pull them down into the uh, face of the clock and then they will uh, that oil will attract dust and dirt and cause more wear so we just take our oiler get just a tiny little bit of oil and touch it to the oil cup and then the oil will be drawn in so we'll go ahead and oil all the pivots and uh, reinstall the, case, uh, the clock in the case. Here is the completed clock with the movement back into the case. And um, there are a few things that I did that I didn't show and uh, that I didn't do and I said I would. Um, mainly, I said that I would bush the hour tube hole and um, I've decided not to. Uh, the hour tube receives so little power as the clock is running. Um, and uh, as it is, it doesn't have any problems with meshing, so there, there really is no point in uh, rebushing the hour tube at this stage. But um, I did end up tightening that uh, one loose leg. Um, I just hit it a few times with the hammer, it tightened right up, so that's one another thing that I didn't show. And uh, otherwise, um, this clock is complete. It took... Um, a lot longer than I would have liked and would have expected, but uh, again, we we're waiting for parts, those bushings and the the paint and uh, whatnot. But uh, here it is all done, and uh, I'll show you what the gong sounds like. On the half hour, it strikes on that bell. Then on the hour, it'll strike on the gong. So there we have it. Um, important thing to note on this clock, um, you can go backwards with the hands. Um, there's no damage that'll be done to the clock if you go backwards. Sometimes with these old count wheels, there, there will be, but this one has a mechanism in there that uh, prevents any damage from happening. And also, um, if the clock is running too fast or too slow, there's this thumb wheel here that you can rotate and that'll raise and lower the pendulum bob inside the clock. And uh, this is an eight-day movement, so I'll let it run for about two weeks to ensure that uh, no more problems arise, that it runs happily and keeps good time. And so, yeah, this clock is complete.